from everybody. It's lovely to, to see you. It'd be lovelier to, to be with you in person, but at these times, like, like you are, our church at Union Hall in Hume is meeting over Zoom and YouTube, uh, so we're not able to, to be with each other face to face, but it is wonderful to have this technology that allows us to, to meet together, to come together and worship our God and have some kind of fellowship together, even if it's not quite as we would like. Um, David made, made a note there that yes, we, we, we know David and Sue quite well from the being on the beach at the beach mission in Crickius, something, something which has been uh, dear to my heart for um, many, many years. Can't even think how many, over 30 now. Um, but uh, I'm originally a, I'm not, well, I'm an, adop I'm an adopted northerner, uh, but I've now spent most of my life in, in the north, originally from, from down south in Cambridge, uh, but moved up to, to Leeds and then over to Manchester when I, I got married to um, to Sarah. Uh, we now have three children um, and are members at Union Hall Church in Hume, as I mentioned. Um, I've been involved there for uh, about 20 years now, um, so that's been good to to get to know people there and be part of that fellowship. And I think you've had a few visitors from, from Union Hall in the past um, as well. Well, we're going to um, turn to God's word now. Um, and so we're going to look at Malachi chapter three this morning. So if you've got a, a Bible handy, um, let's turn to Malachi chapter three. Uh, Malachi is a book right at the end of the Old Testament, the, the, the last book of the Old Testament, in fact. And I'm going to read from the NIV version. Give you a moment to find that. Malachi chapter 3, and we're going to read from verses 6 uh, to verse 18 at the end of the chapter. Okay, so Malachi chapter 3, and it's starting at verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that I will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruits, says the Lord Almighty. And all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper and even those who challenge God escape. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his, in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will, you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Let's just pray before we turn to God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this passage this morning. And we just pray that as we uh, look through this now, that you would speak to each one of our hearts. We pray that you would help uh, any words of mine to simply fall to the floor and be forgotten, that we would remember only your words and we would hear only your message to each one of our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder how you felt as we came to the end of lockdown in, in November. And uh, plans were afoot for an easing of, of rules over Christmas. Uh, we were going to be able to see a few more of our family for five whole days. And there was a sense of optimism that this would happen with the vaccine. Uh, the first few vaccines had been discovered. And uh, 2021 was, was looking like it was going to be a good year. It was looking like things were going to start to get back to normal. There was this sense of, of hope 
an expectancy, at least for, for some people. But then as we came out of that lockdown, something wasn't quite right. Some of the, the infection rates started to go up again in some of the areas. And then suddenly Christmas was cancelled for some or was one day, shrunk down to one day for others. And then, of course, as the year started, uh, for some, one of our children went back to school for one day and then all the schools were shut and we were back in national lockdown again. And there was no promise, no timetable of when things would or could even open up again. And then as January's gone on, even in, in Manchester alone, we've seen unprecedented flood, flooding leading to houses not far from us be, having to be evacuated. There's been in areas of Manchester sinkholes opening up in rows and houses collapsing. And that's not even thinking about events elsewhere in the country and in the world. Something had gone wrong. For those who were hopeful, who were hoping and coming into 2021 with that hope and expectancy, something had gone wrong. And that draws some parallels with our, our message, uh, our passage this morning from Malachi. And Malachi is, uh, as you've seen, is nestled right at the end of the Old Testament. It's written at a time when God's people have returned from exile in the land of Babylon. The gates and the walls and the temple in, temple in Jerusalem have been re rebuilt. And they've received prophecy. People have received some prophecy about what was going to happen from the, the likes of Zechariah and Mike, Micah and Haggai. And the people who returned with a sense of expectation of what was to come. They were expecting God to do things and they have an expectation of what he was going to do and how perhaps it was going to happen. And we see some of that back in the, the book of Micah, just at the end in, in verse chapter four, uh, in chapter four, sorry, in verses one and two. And we read uh, that prophecy that says in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains it will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it many nations will come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the lord to the house of god the god of jacob he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths the law will go out from zion the word of the lord from jerusalem and then later in verses six and seven in that day declares the lord i will gather the lame i will assemble the exiles and those i have brought to grief I will make the lame a remnant, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. And that's what the people were expecting. But something had gone wrong. It hadn't worked out as they'd expected. Doubts had crept in, perhaps, which had led them to a change in their love and in their service and their obedience to God. If we read the whole of Malachi, we'd see some of those examples. And I wonder perhaps if that's how you felt at the end of last year when suddenly that hope and that expectation was suddenly whisked away and suddenly at the start of this year we're plunged back into this lockdown and perhaps we feel like we've gone back to square one or perhaps you've been feeling like that since, since March last year in that first lockdown. Perhaps turning up to church when we can't sing or, or spend time speaking to people when we're able to, to meet in the buildings has just become something that we do and uh, something mundane, and yet we've come a bit, become a bit disillusioned. And the love and the joy that we once had, and the devotion that we felt when we came to church, when we were able to, to shake hands and sing freely in church, that's turned from a joy and a devotion to something perhaps just a bit more mundane, like it had for God's people here in Malachi. And as a result, that mundane religion that we could call it, means we give our second best, or perhaps even not even that, to God just like these people do, did. And so as we come to these, this passage in Malachi, we can see the hope that we have because we have an unchanging God, a hope that transcends any lockdown or fleeting pandemic. And uh, one of my favourite authors, Don Carson, in one of his um, daily devotionals for the love of God, says of this passage, people may be faithless, but the Lord does not change. And that changelessness threatens judgment. It's also the reason that the Lord, uh, sorry, it's even also the reason the people are not destroyed. Hope depends on God's gracious intervention, grounded in his changeless character. And that's the theme that we're going to look at briefly this morning, this unchanging God who uh, loves us throughout everything that's going on. And we can, we're going to, we'll, we'll explore uh, under three headings this unchanging God. First of all, we'll look specifically at the unchanging God. 
and then the changing faithless people and then the faithful people as we work through this passage. First of all, let's look at this unchanging God. And I'm just going to read again verses six and seven from chapter three, where God says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. The people thought that God had changed. They thought that he had broken his covenant with them and was therefore no longer worth living for. If we look back through Malachi, we see the doubts that the, that the people have, which uh, God seems to say, say to them, repeat back to them in, in an almost sarcastic way. At the start of Malachi, in chapter 1 and verse 2, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Uh, they were disheartened and thought that God had stopped loving them. They remembered what it was like back in the good, back in exile. They knew God's promises. But since they hadn't been fulfilled yet, they assumed that God had stopped loving them. And in chapter 2 and verse 17, we read, You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? They thought that good things were happening to bad people. They thought the Lord, the Lord was rewarding these unbelievers for their sin, as it was them who was finding success in the world, and they thought it was God blessing them for it. Therefore, God must have changed in their eyes. He no longer loved his chosen people. But this was God's chosen people, and uh, Paul referred to the covenant um, a few moments ago, and these, these were God's chosen people who'd received the covenant, and um, received great promises during the times of Abraham, Moses, Isaac, David, even these people here in Malachi had received those promises um, as they returned from exile. And yet now they're questioning whether God is true to his word. They've forgotten the likes of 1 Samuel, where we read that it refers to the fact that God is not a man that he should change his mind. And they've only to look back through their history to see how unchanging God was. And some of those, those examples of the covenant that we heard mentioned a few moments ago, the covenant to Noah, when God gave that sign of the rainbow, that he would never destroy life on earth again in that, in that way. That great covenant. And the covenant to Abraham. Abraham was given that promise that he would be the father of many nations. God will make his descendants, his people, his cho chosen royal priesthood, giving them the whole land of Canaan. They would live as his people. He would be their God if they would obey his commands and dedicate themselves to him. But God never gave up on his people, despite their continued disobedience throughout the years. And these people in Malachi's time were an example of this. A remnant returned from exile, and still he was their God. Still he hadn't changed. Only now they thought he had. And yet those promises that I read from, from Micah a few moments ago, had God broken those, broken those promises? No. Promises about the temple being established with people streaming to it as the centrepiece of the land would lead to a great blessing. But because they hadn't yet been answered, the people had forgotten, they'd become disillusioned, they were doubting, they were drifting. Why? Because they hadn't looked at the big picture. They questioned whether, perhaps whether God's lack of an immediate answer meant that he wasn't answering at all. But had God always answered promise, other promises immediately? How many times did Moses have to go up before Pharaoh? And yet it wasn't Pharaoh. Uh, it wasn't just because of Pharaoh's stubborn heart. God gave him that stubborn heart. And it, and it wasn't that God wasn't answering the promise. He was answering at just the right time. And when that final Passover happened, when the angel of death passed over and uh, the firstborn of the Egyptians was struck down, that was a, a symbol of an even greater rescue to come. And that ultimate covenant that we've just shared in. And because God keeps his covenant and doesn't change, the people are not destroyed. The people's sins deserved it, just like ours do. But God didn't turn away from the covenants that he had made. He honoured them. And we see this time again, time and again throughout the Bible, how God does not change. Even in the New Testament, James refers to it 
in chapter 1 and verse 17. Um, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God does not change. He remains faithful and unchanging, unlike the people that we read about here. So let's look briefly at, at the changing faithless people that we, we see from verses uh, 7 to 15. God's diagnosis of the situation is to say, it's you who keep on changing. It's you who keep on turning away from me. And this really is the history of God's people. They keep on turning away from God, showing them in not keeping his laws. And Matthew Henry, the great commentator, goes as far as to say that they're so ignorant of themselves and of the extent of the law of God that they think they need no repentance. And perhaps that's why they seem offended that God is calling out the fact that they need to change because of their disobedience. We could list countless times throughout the Old Testament where people have turned away from God's decrees. The, the grumblings in the desert, making the idols when Moses took too long to come down from the mountain, failing to obey God's commands, to drive out all the inhabitants of the promised land of Canaan, the rejection of God as their king over them literally as their physical king but also as the king of their hearts and that was part of the covenant with Abraham and later with Moses to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and this was exactly what the people had stopped doing and because things hadn't turned out just as they expected they doubted God and when they returned expectantly to their lands their commitment to him had dwindled. Now their worship was mundane, done out of a sense of duty, not a sudden denial of, of, of God, but a gradual one to the point where they hadn't even noticed. Does that sound familiar to our lives and the way in which perhaps our devotion to the Lord and commitments to his church can so easily dwindle or ebb and flow at times? Well, my family lived down in Cambridge, as I mentioned before, and you can almost guarantee that Whenever we visit, and probably especially next time, uh, one of my relatives will, will say, say of our children, oh, how they've grown. Um, that's because they haven't seen them for a while. Whereas I tend to be thinking, oh, they're not really grown that much. Um, but of course, I see them all the time. So when they grow a little bit, I don't notice. And then when we get to my parents and my mum measures them against the, the door frame, it's got all the measurements from throughout many years. Suddenly I can see, oh, they've actually shot up a few inches and I suspect next time we go down, they'll, they'll have shot up a, a, a good number of inches. And it was the same for these people, that they hadn't noticed how far they'd slipped. They hadn't, they hadn't even noticed that they had slipped, perhaps, from the position of faith that they once had. So when God says they've robbed him, they almost don't realise that, they that they've done it. Again, I read those few verses from um, chapter 3. It's, Will a man rob God, God yet you? rob me but you ask how do we rob you in tithes and offerings and i'll show you a few extra verses as well bring me the home so verse nine you are under a curse the whole nation of you because you are robbing me bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house test me in this says the lord almighty and see if i will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. In chapter one, we also see that and um, what's going on with their tithes when we read that um, they're bringing the badly injured, the crippled or diseased animals that are being brought to the temple as an offering. They're not bringing the best animals. And we see elsewhere examples in the Bible where, where this happens. Think of that story of Cain and Abel and then Ananias and Sapphira, where they, uh, they hold back or don't bring their best and therefore they're robbing God of what's due to him because their hearts are not devoted to him in perhaps the way they once were or the way they should be. And how easily do we fall into this trap? It's relatively easy to turn up to things at church, isn't it? To go through the motions, particularly at the moment when we feel there's, there's perhaps less going on. And it's difficult to engage personally or, or naturally with each other. But the real test is what goes on in our hearts and in our heads. Perhaps we once longed to serve, to serve the Lord. We were hungry 
to, to come and hear his word, to have fellowship with other believers so that we could build each other up in our faith, to support each other, to encourage and to share God's word with our friends, our family, our neighbours. Do we still have that same desire to serve the Lord or has it become just mundane? It's often hard to spot this in ourselves or those close to us. Like when I go to visit my family and I can't quite see how much the children have gone, have grown. It's only when others measure them and point it out that we can see the marks on the wall. We can see the difference that's happened in our lives. Perhaps, we've, uh, perhaps sometimes we can easily let our quiet time slip. When we put this or that before our attendance at church or other church meetings, we start to change. We might just miss the occasional quiet time or prayer meeting or service occasionally. Perhaps our alarm doesn't go off. Someone's ill in our family. Another meeting at work overruns and we can't get to things. And, and these things happen and that's fine. But how do we respond to it when they happen regularly? Do we make sure it's just a one-off? Or do we let it happen once a week, a couple of times a week, and suddenly it happens regularly and the ordering of our lives isn't with Christ at the forefront. It's with those other things that take priority. And if we have time, we'll, we'll read the Bible and we'll pray. And if we can make it, maybe we'll, we'll get along to prayer meetings or the service. And then when we start letting things like this slip, that's when God is saying to us in this passage, return to me. And you might think, well, I've not changed. But when we stand back, and we look at those marks on the wall, we can see how we've changed, how we've let other things become more important. We've not carried on giving the Lord what's due to him, our time, our talents, our money. We've been bringing the equivalent of the crippled or lame sacrifices. The second best is all we've been giving to God. What's the solution? God says it right here, doesn't he? Return to me and I will return to you. Bring me the whole time. So what do we need to do? We can repent and give to God what is due to him. And we'll be blessed, it says in this passage. This isn't a matter of prosperity gospel. It's a message to turn back to God, to obedience to him. It doesn't matter what we've done. God doesn't put a criteria on things for turning back to him. Yeah, if you've only broken three of the three or four of the Ten Commandments, you can come back. Or you've been to church most weeks, so you can come back. Or You've read your Bible four times this week, so you can come back. No, there's, there's no criteria. He simply says, return to me and I will return to you. Words that again are echoed in, later in, in James's letter in the New Testament, where he says, submit yourselves to God. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And because he, God, remains faithful and because God does not change, we can come back. We can submit ourselves to him and he will draw near to us with great encouragement. There's also a, another group of people in this passage that we read about uh, in, the, in the final few verses, in verses 16 to 18. And they're a great encouragement for us, to those, from those who haven't grown cynical here, the faithful people, those who haven't turned their passion to a mere practice of religion. Let me read again verses 16 to 18. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them. Just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will see again the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. But despite those who complained, ignored, robbed and turned, turned their backs on him, we see here this faithful remnant standing out from what had become the norm. Compare them to the priests who, uh, who we would expect to, to stand, stand uh, above other people. But in chapter 2, and verse 1 and 2, and now we read, and now this admonition is for you, O priests, if you do not listen, and if you do not set your hearts or heart to honour my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send the curse upon you and I will give curse to your blessings. The priests weren't living up to it, but there is this faithful remnant who have set their heart to honour him. by not showing contempt for his name by putting defiled food on the altars. 
And we can see that contrast between the faithful people and these priests. The priests who are meant to lead the people to the Lord in sacrifice and worship are the ones that are leading them astray. But this faithful remnant honour the Lord. That's not to say they were sinless, of course. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen, fallen short. But we have the answer to get to the people's doubts in verse 17, where we read, In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them. God is going to act. Would they have doubts? Probably. But what did they do, these people, these faithful people? They didn't grumble or complain or give half-heartedly. They talked with each other. They encouraged each other. They honoured and feared the Lord. And in doing so, they remembered his promises and meditated on his word. Their altar sacrifices became real. They saw the bigger picture. And when God hadn't yet fulfilled his promise, they didn't assume that he wasn't listening and that he'd changed. They continued to wait on the Lord's timing. And in fearing the Lord, they understood who he was. He was the unchanging God. And this godly fear drove them to love, honour and obey him, which includes waiting on the Lord in the knowledge that his plans and his purpose will prevail. And what was the result of their obedience and honouring God? We read it there. Their names are written in the angel's scroll and the Lord says they will be mine. I will spare them. You will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. That's why they were, they were, it's a great thing to remain faithful despite the many things that can be put in our way. So I wonder, where do you stand this morning? Are you here because you should do? You think you, think, you, think you should do? But actually, you're not sure you want to be. You're just used to doing it. So we sign on every week. Or perhaps you want to see some friendly faces, um, but none of this really means much anymore. It's just a chance to, to see other people. Well, let's hear these words from Malachi this morning. Let's hear the warnings of those who doubt the Lord and those who rob him, those who turn their back on the Lord. And let's have hope. Let's heed these warnings because he is saying to us, return to me. Or perhaps, perhaps turn to him for the first time. Look at the marks on the wall. Look how you've perhaps slipped and compare where your faith once was to where it is now. We can so easily get bogged down in the things of this world and there's so much media driven doom, it seems at times. And this pandemic seems to be almost feel endless at times. And there's many other things going on in the world which can make us downcast and can make us question and wonder, where is God? Is he going to act? Or we're reminded here that, yes, God is still here. He hasn't changed one bit. And because of that, his grace is ever more present today. He's the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Who Isaiah says doesn't faint or grow weary. He's the same as he was when he created the universe. He's the same as he when he spoke to Malachi and when he sent his son into the world to give us all that great new covenant of hope of a future. He's the same as he was before this pandemic and he's the same as he will be after. And because he's not changed, we won't be destroyed. Our actions and our sins might deserve it. But his son, who was with him in the beginning and has taken that punishment for us, has taken our sin. And now he calls to us and says, return to me and I will return to you. It'll be worth it. Just ask that, that faithful remnant, as we can read here. Keep that big picture in, in our minds and return to him so that our name can be written on that scroll. And we will be part of his treasured possession, all because he is that unchanging God. So even though perhaps for many, 2021 hasn't started off as we'd have hoped for, um, but in these unchanging times, in these changing times, we have an unchanging God and we have a greater hope that will never perish, spoil or fade. So let's put our trust and our hope in that unchanging God. Well, let's just pray together before I hand back to David. Heavenly Father, we, once again, we thank you for this word. We thank you for, for your um, Bible and all it can teach us. We thank you, Lord, that um, in these unsettled, troubling times, that you are an unchanging God, one who has never broken his covenant promises with his people and one who will never break his covenant promises with his people. 
And so, Lord, help each one of us to examine our own hearts and to turn back to you, to um, put our hope and our trust in you, despite all the uncertainty and difficulties and illnesses that perhaps we face. Help us not to give you second best, but to give you our best and to receive uh, that great promise that in, uh, we will be part of your treasured possession. And uh, would you say to each one of us, you will be mine. Help us to trust you, our faithful and unchanging God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Once again, thank you for inviting me. And I'll hand back to David. Thank you again, man.